on. Hello. Hello, everyone. And welcome to Scripting for Beginners 5. It's me, Andy. Nice to see you again. Wackim, I've seen that you're already uh, talking about it and saying hi. So nice to see you, Wackim. Um, Wackim Samake. Uh, how's everyone doing out there? I hope you're all doing super well. Um, yeah. This is uh, the fifth and final installment in this mini series. So uh, I'm going to keep doing uh, learn game dev streams, but we're kind of drawing this scripting for beginners part to a close. This was really about introducing uh, new concepts. So from the very, very beginning, like how, um, what is scripting, what is code, all of this stuff. Um, and I'm hoping that when it comes to this part of the series, like this last episode, um, you're feeling a little bit more comfortable with what scripting is and how you might go about doing it. And also the idea really is to get to the point where you can kind of solve your own problems. Um, I know that, that sounds a bit mean, but I think it's like you know where to go for help, not solve your own problems, because that implies that you don't need any help ever. And everyone needs a little bit of support at some point, right? When, especially when you're coding. What I mean is what you know, you get to a point where you can understand some stuff and you can, you know how to support yourself to find solutions and to where to go to help when you might need to go to the API docs, when you might need to go to a tutorial or another YouTube video, when you might need to reach out to the community. Um, or, you know, whether you might need to post on the forum and ask for a feature. You, you get to that point where you sort of know where where you're at. And, and that's an amazing place to be. As soon as you feel like you can start, um, you know, figuring out how to find your answers, that's, a set, that's the hardest part is the getting started. Because wh when you start coding, like the difficulty curve is like this. <laughs> and it takes a lot of motivation to get over that very ver steep difficulty curve um, where you're having to get your head around all these concepts, coding, uh, the process of breaking down a problem, talking to a computer, you know, rem remote client server stuff and schedules and multi-threading, conditionals and for loops and all this stuff we've been talking about. Um, and whether it's sunk in or whether, you know, you come back to this in a few months time and you're like I don't I don't remember any of this these tutorials will stay up these streams will stay up um and hi guys hi dry coast hi Hoff hi Naya how's it going nice to see you again thank you so much for joining me it's lovely to have some familiar faces uh, every week when I do this and and know that you guys are enjoying it that means a lot to me and to be honest it's why we keep going so uh yeah nice to see you all um so yeah what I was saying was hopefully you're getting to the point where you're starting to feel like you know how how to find help <laughs> with your with your coding problems. Uh, that's the hardest part. Uh, and like maybe not feeling like you know nothing as well, because that's like quite a motive, uh, quite demotivating, motivating when you start something new. The thing is about coding is to keep your motivation up. Um, know that there will be a solution. I know that sometimes when you're hitting a problem and you've been working on it for hours, it feels like this is there is no solution. But I promise the lo like if you keep going, you will find one. Whether it's the solution you thought about, whether it's a workaround, whatever it is. Something I found in my experience of coding is. Sometimes I can sit and be working on a problem for six hours and then I'll get up and I'll get so frustrated and I'll leave the room and I'll rage quit and I'll be like, nope, that's it. I'm never going to find a solution. And then five minutes later, I've realized what I was doing wrong and it will be something really silly. And i will sat there for hours and hours and then I'll come back and be like, oh, it's just I needed to put a then after the line that says if on it. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, never fear. There is always a solution. Whether it's that kind of thing or whether it's more like a, I, I actually can't do this specific thing that I wanted to do. Let me find a workaround. That's okay as well. Sometimes it's better to find an easier, less like, you know, technical workaround. Uh, and it, that can explode into some more interesting sides of, of games. Like if you think about 
some uh, incredible games that are out there, they're not necessarily the most technically impressive games. That is actually, oh, by accident, I've arrived at the, one of the key lessons for today, which is make a game. And, um, and it's a classic conundrum that programmers everywhere fall into, me included. It's so exciting and fun to get all deep and technical and into your code that sometimes you miss the whole point, which was to make the game that you wanted to make. And you end up like making a bunch of really sweet systems with beautiful code that mesh in and decouple and all this sort of sweet stuff. Uh, but you like you've made an engine and you come out of the other side and you haven't actually made the game. You've made an engine so someone else can make a game uh, or like you run out. You essentially just run out of um, of uh, motivation for that game because it's got so technical and so involved and you or, yeah hours and hours of coding and you haven't made a game so keep your, your keep your focus on making a game your code is there to get you to the point where you can make whatever game you want to make that's what your coding's for and uh, if it's you know if it's stopping you from making the game that you want to make then use packages or find a workaround that's a really important thing that I wanted to talk about today um so yeah uh I've jumped straight in at like the biggest part of the the whole thing but uh never mind <laughs> should be okay let's uh let's do a quick recap so uh this is the game we're working on oh I was gonna show you this because I was so excited to show you this uh let me go I'm gonna show you because it's my stream so I'm gonna do that uh play I want to go, look at all these amazing games that we've got. Uh, what I wanted to do was go to my games. So I just wanted to show you if uh, last stream I said I was going to, well, the stream before last I said, oh, I'm going to make this a remixable game, my scripting for beginners game, and I'll add it to Tutorial Springs. Um, and I made it a remixable game and it took me ages to actually get around to adding it to Tutorial Springs. So I just wanted to show you that I have done that. Here's Tutorial Springs with some NPCs. Um, that's another learning point for today that I'll talk about in a minute. But if we go up here, up these steps, yeah, you can see it, there it is. Yay, scripting for beginners. So it's out there. You can play it and it's in Tutorial Springs. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's the thing that's happened. And you can say so you can get to it through Tutorial Springs. That's what I wanted to show you. Anyway, um, stop, <laughs> stop talking about Tutorial Springs. Back to today. So uh, oh, now I'm loading into the game and I didn't really think that through. Um, it's okay. It's okay. I need to go into the editor. Um, let's go. Go back to the editor. Here we go. Create. So that's how you get into the editor. <laughs> Press escape and then you go to the create menu and you create a game. What we're doing today is we are going to have a recap of what we did last week. Uh, I've got my notes here, which is good, just uh, in case I forget. Uh, so recapping what we did last week and then looking at a few key concepts today. Um, uh, we're going to go back over some of the stuff that we've learned, but uh, and try and use all of these different things we've learned a little bit to piece together some kind of end result to this thing. It's nice to have a bit of a, a wrap up end result game uh, out of this uh, virtual environment we've been making. Uh, so we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna wrap that up, uh, this place up, make, um, uh, add some traps, some damage, some health and all of that kind of thing. I'm really open to suggestions. As always, if you've got any questions or suggestions, um, there was a really great question on the uh, in the comments for the last stream, which was how do we test games um, with uh, that that require multiple people? Uh, and I don't have an amazing answer. Uh, it's something that I've uh, taken back to the team. Um, but one of the things I would say is uh, go to Discord and head over to the looking for feedback channel and post your game in there. Um, you might have to publish it in like an alpha or a beta or an early access type state in order to get other people playing your game. I think it was Hoff, the Hoff that said, that asked uh, this question. So 
looking for feedback and amazingly on a Friday at 5 p.m. GMT, 5 p.m., 4 p.m. When is that? When is Feedback Friday? Hang about. You'd think I'd know. I went to the last one. Uh, feedback Friday. Where's our events? Is it in here? No. Can't remember. Anyway, four o'clock GMT. That's it. On a Friday is our Feedback Friday on the Discord. So head over to the Discord. Um, post your game in looking for feedback. And we will play it. Thank you, Naya. Naya says 4 p.m. Thanks, Naya. I was there. I just, it was 4.30 last Friday. And so that's thrown me. Um, but it's usually four o'clock. Head over there. And if you want to test your game with multiple people, that's an amazing place to do it. It's also a great place to test your game and get loads of feedback from other people. So um, feedback is one of the best ways we learn. Uh, you know, sometimes it's quite hard to open yourself up to criticism, but it's amazing the... Uh, the speed at which you will improve if you do that. It's much, much faster to, to put yourself out there, put your game out there and say, what do you think? And get some feedback from some really cool, creative people who are lovely and will look after you and make sure that you know the feedback is constructive. Um, and if you're one of those people, make sure you're giving constructive feedback. Things that don't phrase things like, oh, this is wrong. Phrase things like, you could do this to make it better. So think of the solution and, and try and present those as well. Anyway, I'm drifting off all over the place. Tangents, Tangent City. Uh, that's what we should call this game. Uh, right. So, um, so far, we talked about what is coding. Coding is instructions. I'm not going to go over this too much again because we've been over it every week. But coding is essentially instructions that programmers give computers. Uh, the computer is a tool that thinks hyperlogically and in a mathematical way. Programmers are humans that don't necessarily think hyperlogically and speak in language. Code is this language that sits between computers and um, coders. And it's a way that we can talk to, coders can talk to computers, computers can talk to coders, and coders can talk to other coders as well. We leave sprinkle behind little comments in our code to tell each other what is going on in our code. Hopefully, sometimes we forget to do that and then hope that everyone's okay and just navigating the code that we've written. Um, but it's a good idea to do that. Anyway, uh, yeah, co that's what code is. Code is instructions. And in a game, we leave behind those instructions so that our game world can react to the players in the way that we want it to. This game world that we've made so far has got some really cool effects and juicy bits. It doesn't actually do much in terms of gameplay, but what you can do is things like turn these lights on. Um, so as a coder, we, we've coded these lights to come on when I interact with them by pressing a E on the keyboard or X on the controller. Uh, we've also coded this lever to switch uh, when we interact with it and unlock the door, which we can now open by pressing the pedestal there. And, um, oh, spooky. And then we coded this fun bit, which is fun. It's like one of my favorite things I've done and did it on stream. So proud of that. And it wasn't even my idea to do that order. That was who's that was someone else's idea. I think it might have even been Naya's, and it was just yeah, so much better. Anyway, uh, yeah, that happens. Oh, I've uh, dressed this up a little bit more, so we've got some some clues here. That's a fun thing. If you're making a game, a mystery game, it's quite fun to just leave uh, clues, and then you can leave red herrings as well. Um, and we also. Um, so we, we coded all this stuff. We coded the uh, pedestal and the switch with events. We looked at events, didn't we? We looked at locking the door using conditional statements, which was like when we did if, then, and all that stuff. Um, we looked at arrays and for loops, and that allowed us to do the mad, you know, groups of entities, manipulating a whole group of entities, um, under one property so storing a whole group of things in one identifier and then accessing each individual one numerically which meant we could use for loops to, to basically iterate through an array go through each item in an array and modify that item or change its behavior or whatever which is a super powerful thing to do um yeah and we also looked at, last week, we started experimenting with the idea of clients and servers. Let's go and have a look at some code, see if we can remember that. I've got a cup of tea this week. That's good, isn't it? 
just regular tea, in case you're wondering. Just, you know, Yorkshire tea, actually, I think. I can't remember. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so we were looking at the this script. And we were saying, like, let's change the time of day on individual people's computers. Excuse me, sir. <coughs> um, so, so that if one person solves the puzzle, uh, so that when we change the time of day, it only changes for one person. So you can change the time of day by interacting with this sundial or this sundial secret sundial up here um you can change the time of day and i was thinking like it'd be really fun to make it so you can change the time of day and then a puzzle presents itself uh and then we so and uh, so we looked at doing that just for the person that interacted with the sundial using uh this if we are running on the server then send to all clients change time of day so send an event called change time of day which essentially runs this same function but then it runs it on the client and we said that there is this game is running on a client each person that is playing creator has a client which is the computer that they're currently playing on if you're playing on stadia your client is in the cloud but you've still got a client okay the group of people in one game world like if it was me and a few other people all editing this game world. We would each have the our own instance of the game running on our own clients. And that's sending information to one server that's shared between all of us. So for each game world, there's a server running. And for each person in that game world, there's a client. And the clients and the servers are constantly talking to each other. The client is constantly sending uh, inputs up to the server of where the player is, what they're doing, you know, what buttons they've pressed, if they shot their gun, if they been hurt, if they jumped, what have they, you know, what have they done recently? And the server takes all of the information from all the different clients, uh, gobbles it all up. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Anyway, it takes all of this information and then it it uh, it runs its own version of the game, but without any graphics. It's running its own version of exactly the same game and then it computes. It's almost like simulating for everyone what the interaction between everyone has uh, arrived. What's the result of that? And then it sends that back out to all of the clients. So clients take every all the information that the user is giving it, all the key presses and moving around and all that stuff, send all that to the, sorry about that, send all that to the server. The server takes all that information, computes what's going on in the game and sends that back to the clients, which then update, they take that information, the client takes that information from the server and updates, oh, they're in this position and they're doing this. And it, it, it's kind of like a constant check-in. Hey, am I, am I here? Yeah, you, you're there, okay, cool. Uh, and that kind of thing. So the clients are constantly checking in with the server uh, and the server's doing some some heavy game logic code, um, doing it, managing it very well, if I do say so. Well done, server, uh, on that. Uh, and yeah, and then sending the results back to the player, which keeps everyone in sync, right? So everyone who's in that game world is, um, is not like jumping around or you shoot at someone and then they suddenly over the other side of the map so the bullet misses them or anything like that so the service job is to make sure that all of that makes sense which means we can run specific code on specific clients we can tell individual clients hey you do this you update this and generally speaking we try and do graphical stuff in this way rather than like the heavy proper game logic stuff Things like collisions would not be a very good thing to do on just a client because let's say I open this door just for one client and then that client can walk through it for everyone else. They've just walked through a door and that can break immersion and isn't ideal. But what is really good is to do graphical stuff like change the process, the post process or change um, the time of day and especially anything to do with UI, anything to do with notifications like this or you know health bars like this all of that 
should be done on the client's computers because the server doesn't care about graphics. It doesn't even necessarily have a graphics card. It probably does to do all the physics computing. But it doesn't necessarily have a screen to display it. So it doesn't care. Um, whereas our, our players and their client computers definitely do care about the graphics. So um, yeah, that is the server-client relationship we talked about last, uh, last week. And so, we got some more people. Odyssey, Russ. Hey, Russ. Oh, 4 p.m. BST. Yeah, we're in British summertime now. Sorry. <laughs> I made exactly the same mistake somewhere else. That's fine. Um, uh, yeah, cool. So, what are we doing today? Oh, I've just picked up some spikes. Whoops, control Z. Uh, well, today we are going to, oh, and then just to finish off, what we did last week was we did all of that stuff and then we started mucking around with the idea of having roles. And uh, a role is like something one particular person can do when someone else might have a different job. So giving people different jobs by using that client server relationship. So we said that one person can open this door. So if we look at the door, it checks here whether a person can open the door. They have to be given the role door person. And we also did a check where we said um, if someone interacts with the sundial in here, there's a sundial on that gong. Do you see it sticking out? There's also a sundial up here. If someone interacts with a sundial, it'll only work if they are that have the role sundialer. And so you can't have both roles. You can only be a sundialer or a door person. For the purposes of this uh, stream today, I'm actually gonna comment out this return. Actually, I'm gonna comment out this whole chunk. So this is how you do a block comment, dash dash square square bracket like that. And then two n square brackets to comment out a chunk of code. Um, the reason I'm going to comment this out is because we're not thinking about this stuff too much today, um, but we might want to be able to do these things, interact with, you know, change the time of day and all that sort of stuff when we interact with things. Um, so that's another way to test um, your multiplayer part of it is just by maybe commenting out some of the stuff that's very, very specific. If you can find a way to test that. <coughs> it's not ideal um, uh, but it's something we would probably love to have a look at a better solution to in the future right so uh, yeah oh um, I should also let's just let's just run the game and see where we're at at the moment just in case everyone's forgotten so at the moment uh, we made it so we can turn these lamps on yes and open the door that for some reason my sound effects are very quiet interesting and then ah yeah I put on tilt shift didn't I and changed the time of day so it's like what time of day is this I don't even know hey daytime There, still nighttime insects, but eh, never mind. Uh, today. Ah, there we go. Today, we're going to make it. Firstly, if you interact with a gong, probably should make the sound of a gong. So, rule number one. Um, <laughs> we're going to look at health. Now, health is a really important part in a lot of games. Um, and essentially, it's just a number. And so you can have health and then get damaged and all that's going to do is reduce that number, right? If we look at our health, which is attached to our player, this is just going on the default top level. How, what is health thing? Health is just this number. It's a thousand. Uh, it's an arbitrary number. So we have our player and they've got uh, a script attached to them, which is called health script. And you might be wondering, what 
Why? How did that happen? Mine doesn't have that. I started this game from a, an obstacle course template. And the obstacle course template gives you something that can kill you, something that can uh, damage your health, gives you checkpoints and respawning, and it gives you health. And this is what I was saying when I was saying the coding is there. It's a tool to help you to make a game. And sometimes you don't have to code everything in order for the game to be yours. In fact, sometimes it's a good idea to pick your battles and code the things that you want to code and then see if there's something else that will do the heavy lifting or the jobs that you don't necessarily want to do. So that said, while I've used that blueprints initially to make this game and it's um, uh, the obstacle course blueprint, uh, you can add health to your game by looking in the community for the package health. And the one you're thinking you, you might want is the crater one. So we can check this crater packages box and then it's got this little crater logo, which means it's an official package, which means that when a new version of the game comes out, like the one that did last week, hey, um, they it's been tested to ensure it works. And look, it says install update. So let's make sure that's installed. Um, the health package is a part of the uh, obstacle course blueprint. So these template games, uh, like this one, they are made up from made up of essentially a pre-designed terrain voxel mesh like this that's usually very very simple, and then a bunch of packages which are all available in other you know in any game in Creator. All of those packages are available in any game, but the packages have already been installed set up and configured to make sure that they work so if you're running a game if you're working on a game and you suddenly realize you need health but you didn't start from the obstacle course template or the gun game template or something you can go and install the health package now that doesn't fit like sort it and make it just work it doesn't do that um what it has done is it's added a bunch of files to your project and we can see those files in here, in the Packages tab. Uh, these are all of the packages that make up the Obstacle Course um, Starter Template, the Obstacle Course Blueprint. And here's our health package down here. I've also installed Mighty Animations, which is a really good animations package uh, made by Mighty Co. So in health, we can see it's actually only got three assets. Health Widget, Health Script, and player health. And so uh, player health is actually a template and it's a script folder. If you go in and you install a package and you see something with player at the start of it like that, it usually means that that thing needs to be added to the player template. So if we go to the player template, this health is actually an instance Let's open this out. It's an instance of template player health. So what is the player? This player here is a character. And it's the physical person that's running around the game. This person here that's... Let's turn off that. It's, it's this person. That's what the player template is. Is this person that's running around. The player template here... Therefore, you can attach things to that player template and it means when you spawn a player, they will already have these things attached. In the obstacle course blueprint, it has the health script folder attached, which has got the health script and the health widget within that script folder. It also has the player template in the obstacle course blueprint also has obby player, the script folder obby player attached. Again, um, that's a template, or well, play, that's a part of the player template. Uh, in Obby Player script folder, there's one script called Obby Player Script, and this script is really just concerned with making sure the player is checking into the checkpoints. So we have a couple of scripts there. 
that are already attached to our player uh, because of our obstacle course um, uh, blueprint. But if you didn't use the obstacle course blueprint, you can download the health package and essentially just drag the player health template onto our player and it will give them this little nice widget in the corner. Uh, and it also means that when they get hurt by something, it, it can take health off. Let's dive into the health script. That's the cool thing about packages. They're an amazing opportunity to learn, um, especially like the Crater ones. They're the officially supported ones. They're written by the dev team um, in Crater, uh, the people who make it. So uh, they're like very, very solid. Um, if we dive in here, we can see some of the code and we can learn from this. We can see that there's an init function. Well, we know about init functions. We've looked at them before. So let's, um, let us uh, just do this one, Poop. and go api.creator.com. Uh, so there's the init function is one of the entry points to the script. So an entry point, if we remember, these entry points were functions that Creator calls. So these get called behind the scenes. We don't have to try and execute this code ourselves. This function will get called by Creator when whatever this script is attached to is spawned. And the same with many, many other things. And for a list of all of the entry points, you can go to the script part of the api.creator.com and that all of the entry points are down here. So we have all of these different events we can hook into. And we talked about that before. So if we just look in, in here, we've also got this on damage function, which is really important. Um, now, this is one of those situations where in it, you can kind of imagine that Creator would call it in it from Creator, like the initialization code. Um, that's what in it stands for. Whereas on damage, you might be tempted to think, oh, I need to, do I need to call that myself? Well, actually, that's here. So that's another event that Creator calls, which means there's a whole system behind the scenes that's concerned with damaging players and damaging entities. And so uh, rather than us writing our own system to do all of this damage stuff, we're going to leverage the API to, to, to essentially use the damage stuff that already exists in the API in order to do any kind of player damage, player health, and also to, to destroy things in our game environment. Um, so we've got the on damage function, and it says this is called when an entity is damaged on all scripts of the entity. So any script that's attached to any entity, if that entity has some damage, then the on damage function in, that, in every script that's attached to it is called. And what's more, we can also, let's control F, apply. this is script, isn't it? And also, if we go to entity, and go to apply, you can see this is how we damage something. We call the apply damage. So if you're not sure about something, two really good places to look in the API docs are the document for entity, which is like what everything in your game world is essentially an entity at its root. And then, you know, it might be a character, which is an entity that extends in some ways. Um, to include character stuff. It might be a mesh, which is still an entity, but it extends in some ways to do with meshes. But essentially entity is a really good place to check, see if there's some functionality in there that you can use. And script for the entry points is also worth looking at. Okay. So, let's make something that hurts the player. So if you wanted to install the health package, you can do that. And I've shown you how to do that. Let's look at, uh, we've got our player, we've got health. And we looked a little bit at the health script, but we got to on damage and on damage is uh, a function that gets called when our player experiences some damage. Uh, and here we go, it says, 
we know what this is. We did if statements. It says if our HP is less than zero, then return. Uh, otherwise, make our HP. So HP stands for health points. So if our health health is less than or equal to zero, like exit the on damage, we don't care because we'll handle getting killed somewhere uh, further down. If our if our health uh, otherwise, so at this point, our health, we know our health is above zero. Uh, then take some damage, whatever the amount is. On damage takes two arguments here, the amount of damage we're gonna take and where does it come from? We're just worry about the amount of damage for now. So if our health is bigger than zero, i.e. we have some health, then reduce it by however much. And then this math.max is quite clever because it's just saying reduce our health by whatever amount. And if it's less than zero, make it zero. That's what that line here, there means. But rather than writing it in a conditional, uh, we're using the maths library, which is in Lua already. And then stop recovering the health. And then this is the key part here where if it's equal to zero, then kill the player. So reduce, if it's less than or equal to zero, they're already dead. Reduce the health until it gets to, uh, reduce the health and if it's zero or less than zero, make it zero. And then if our health is zero, kill the player either here, if we know uh, who has killed the player or here if we don't know who's killed the player, i.e. they've fallen off the edge of the world or something. So there's some key, uh, key parts. Uh, if we haven't killed the player, then allow them to recover their health using that scheduling we talked about. So it could look a little bit scary coming into this health script, um, but take your time with it and read through it line by line. I'm not gonna go into any of this other stuff. We don't really need to think about that right now. The key part is this in it and this uh, on damage. So we're gonna utilize the on damage thing. Let's uh, stop editing our player template. Let's just make ourselves a little obstacle so that we can damage our player and see what that looks like. Uh, I know, I'm gonna just grab, it'd be cool to do it in here. Maybe we do it in here. Can I just start with this door open? If I check that open box, did I program that? I didn't program that, did I? To make this easy for ourselves, I'm gonna hook that Boolean there up. We've got this open Boolean. Um, so what we'll do is when the game starts and when this door is spawned, which is the init function, if our open Boolean is equal to true, then uh, self open door. We'll just call this door function, this open door function. What's really cool is that if um, if the expression between if and then is true, we can just not check against true. We can just say if that, because if that is true, then that expression resolves as true, which means that this gets called. So we've hooked up open now so when I play the game the door hey door why are you not open <laughs> is door script not on the door interesting bit of live debugging, not sure why. Okay. <laughs> oh, is it because it needs the player? Some, oh, it's locked. Oh yeah, all right, unlock it. Unlock the door and open the door, wow. The door lock is so strong, it can even protect against coders. No, that wasn't it. Okay, one sec. <laughs> wow. Uh, if the door's not locked, if it's not open, then... Oh, wow. Okay, 
just going to have to just not run the open door function and just open the door this way. Can I just do open? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I just, yeah, I was just trying to hook that up so that we didn't have to solve the puzzle every time. And then, like, I can turn it all back on and do stuff later. Uh, cool. Right. What I want to do, ah, scared me. Um, what I want to do is put some kind of spooky obstacle in here, some kind of damaging thing. I think to start with, we'll just have a massive spinning blade or something um, that can hurt us. And then uh, we'll go from there. Um, cool. So, ah, this, this is a nice one. That's a fun obstacle, isn't it? Let's have it between the old... I think that'll look nice in here. And if I got that right, yeah, that's about... That looks... So the thing about obstacles... And we actually ran a workshop on this on Thursday, which was really fun. Um, it's like a hazard perception uh, workshop. The thing about obstacles that you have to remember is they have to be really obviously an obstacle. They have to look dangerous. If they don't look dangerous, your player doesn't know that they're an obstacle. Uh, if I accidentally just rotated that. Yes. No, that is the way I want to do it. Uh, let's put this rod here. Yeah. Something like that. I mean, not, we're not going <laughs> to do much more of that. Uh, okay, so, um, I've got an obstacle. I'm going to make leave it stationary for now, just while I'm testing that it's going to hurt my player. Um, now, I could, if I wanted to, because this is an obstacle course, I could grab the script, the uh, death collision script that we have here. But I wanted to, let's start doing some coding. Let's, let's look at leveraging the API in Crater to um, damage our player. So we're going to add... Uh, a new script and this is going to be called an obstacle script hopefully there's not already an obstacle script the obstacle script here we go and so what does the obstacle script need to do let's open up this and let's do the old diagram it's always worth it hang on there you go um uh, can I have a new layer, please? Thank you. I'm very polite to my computer. <laughs> ah. um, it was, it was all plugged in. So I just took it out thinking that that would be fine. Cool. Okay. Cool. Right. So, brush pink today. Uh, what's going to happen? Let's go and have a look. We've got an axe. It's going to swing eventually, but not right now. So, uh, we've got our start. Uh, I guess what we need to do is uh, axe collides with player and I just use w slash for my uh, shorthand for with axe collides with player and at that point damage player So, before we go and just make this uh, a reality, what do we need to know? We need to know how much we need to damage the player. And so, we can think, okay, I need to know uh, an amount or I need to know a value here. 
um, how much health does the player have? Because that will decide how much we damage them. If the player has one health, then we will damage them a number between zero and one. We could damage them 0.5, which would take away half their health. We could damage them one, which would take away all of their health. We could damage them zero, which would take away no health at all. So we need to know how much. And in order to work out how much, we need to know how much, much health does the player have? What else do we need to know? Is there anything else? I guess some other things we might need to think about are sound, um, effects. I mean, that usually comes a bit later on, but we should be thinking about this stuff as a game designer and as a game developer. We should be thinking about all of this stuff at the beginning as well. Um, axe collides with player. Movement? What kind of movement does of axe? What kind of movement does the axe have? Um, is there going to be more than one axe? Is it going to start swinging? When does it start swinging? Uh, so if we're going to have movement, when does the movement, excuse my handwriting, start slash stop? So just, <laughs> just two steps in our problem and actually quite a lot of questions and this is a really valuable exercise when you're starting any new bit of code rather than diving in we could have dived in gone oh you know we've got it we we'll just do that easy and for this situation we probably could have you know been okay but the exercise is kind of about thinking about outside of that and if if we were in a group like we are on our workshops on thursday we would be doing this all together and i'd i'd be asking people to chip in suggest things sinjin wants us to look at red barrels we could do that in a minute explosions sinjin you're talking my language <laughs> um but these questions are like really valuable and important for us as as coders to think about we, it'd be nice to think about this stuff up front. And don't think, just because we're thinking about things like effects and sound, don't think it has to have that. There's a really uh, cool sort of um, theory about this uh, that's called Moscow. Oh, still, still using the old zoom in, huh, Andy? Um, Moscow which stands for most, oh, actually, ah. <laughs> should be drawing on this layer, really. Stands for must, should, could, won't. Must, should, could, and won't. I know it's a bit blurry. That's not your screen. That's because I'm drawing in a soft, gentle pen, <laughs> gentle paintbrush, some sort, probably an airbrush. Anyway, um, if I zoom out enough, it looks fine. Uh, and so we're thinking about, and this, this is a, a tool that we use as coders to think about the scope of the thing that we're making. And when I say scope, I mean the size of it. What is it going to do? What isn't it going to do? What would you really love it to do, but probably is a bit like like a lot of work for not much impact? So we have our, our must, should, could, and won't. And the way we decide what it's going to do is we always balance how much effort and time and technically money, you know, time is money, how much time and effort is this feature is this thing going to take versus what is the impact for the player in the game and it's a constant balancing act between because you could spend 16 hours making a really beautiful barrel explosion 
and that would be time well spent. <laughs> but you could also spend 16 hours making an entire game and um, you have to constantly balance what is the impact versus the outlay of time. And when you're just starting coding, sometimes it's a good idea to keep things really simple so that you create games and then you learn from them and make and can move on to the next game. Hoff, will the player be instantly killed by the axe or will the player be damaged continuously when he collides with the axe? How will the damage stop when the player moves away from the axe? Yeah, all great questions. So when the axe actually collides, let's switch back to our blue here. Blue, yeah. This is, blue is our questioning color. Hmm. <laughs> Oh, just draw there. Um, all of these are great questions. So, what happens at impact? I think I'm gonna I'm gonna have to just because of space. Technically, I should have an infinite canvas, but I haven't got one. I've just got a massive canvas, but I'm really zoomed out. I should be like writing this big, but I've already committed to writing this big. Anyway, stop talking about the stream and actually talk about game dev. Uh, uh, what happens at the point of impact with the axe? So when the axe hits the player, what happens? You know, it's easy if the axe is moving. I, this is the outlay versus um, the, the cost versus benefit. Cost benefit. Uh, again, you could make it so that if the axe is moving, it pushes the player in a specific direction or sends them flying against the wall of the, the temple or something. You could totally do that. It might take you a while to balance all of the physics and stuff, but it would look really cool. But how important is that to what your game is trying to, what experience your game is trying to give your player? And that's what it comes down to. Um, you know, this tight, tight, the, the time you spend in this is not, uh, you might feel like it is, but it's not completely limitless because at some point you got to press the publish button and you want to do that before you run out of motivation on the game you're working on. <laughs> so you're actually up against your own motivation <laughs> for the game. Um, maybe I'm just talking about myself here. Shoot me a message if you agree with that. <laughs> you're constantly fighting. You're basically constantly fighting against your own motivation to uh, finish what you're working on. So all of these questions, are they useful? Um, what we can do is with the questions now, we can do some answers where we, you know, we could just quickly run around uh, another color, yellow. Uh, we could just run around and we could say movement of the axe uh, is a two. It should move. When does the movement start and stop? Um, well, we'll think about that at two. Uh, what happens at the point of impact with the axe? That is a one. We need to think about that right now. Uh, I will knock back the player. Knock back player. With, because I know that that's one line of code. I know how easy that is. Uh, if you didn't know that, what would you do if you didn't know that uh so you would have this what happens at the point of impact with the axe you might come up with a few ideas knock back the player take some health off take some health off take health off um you might also be like ah oh, you know i don't really know how, what could i do and then you're in like a bit of a research phase before you even answer these questions Hoff says, motivation is a limited resource for me too. I want to get results fast or else I will be frustrated. Yeah, 100%. And uh, also, like making something quickly and learning why it's broken is a really good way to learn. <laughs> uh, it's really valid to like just blitz make a game as quick as you can and then go back and look at it and get feedback from players and look at it yourself and analyze it and critique it and think about what could be better and then make a second version of that but take a little bit longer and refine it a little bit or even just work on the same game and keep going back again and again and again keep working on it 
like there's there's quite a lot of amazing games that have won awards um spark awards and things like that um that have just been you know that started small and just grew and grew and grew and got better and better um and so it's a completely valid approach to like think of just one game and then just work on that and constantly improve and iterate on it so um you could start small and you could start quick and dirty and then you know keep working on it and make it better because that's a good way to handle your own motivation as well um anyway we were talking about answering this question and a good way to do this if you're not sure is to go away and research sure you could go to the api docs but why not also go and have a look at some tutorials go and look at some of the screenshots and clips in the discord and see what other people are doing when you know go play play some games play games on crater or any game and think about what's going on you know think of a game where there's another swinging axe go and play that and then see what they do maybe play like five games and think about what you know you could play it and immediately go oh just use that or you could play it have that effect and see what see what the effect is on yourself and on your character in the game and then think hmm that's an interesting idea what could i do that either takes parts of that or is even better or is a mash of this idea and this idea and this idea um and this is where we can be really creative as programmers we can go away and research all these cool things and then say ah how about this we do this when our axe hits us uh for me i'm going for something really simple and basic knock back the player take some health off uh effect and sound uh yeah we probably need sound as a two effects is a three could have effects how much health that's a research point how much health does the player have we need to look at that first um we could make the axe like the axe at the treasure hunt in the hub oh the axe in the treasure hunt is amazing i love it i also love the flying sharks um how much health does the player have let's go and find out research the player health uh uh oh there it is max hp 1000 what if i change this ah so it changed the health widget to say 100 let's see if i change it to be what happens if i change max hp to be one client bar speed is how quickly it moves up. there you go i've got a health of one <laughs> so that's an easy way to make every obstacle lethal <laughs> just put the health down to one uh i think a thousand we'll leave it as it was um but so uh we've got a thousand health one thousand so our players have got a thousand health um so how much damage should our axe cause mm, i'd say it's probably very dangerous uh so maybe it needs to take off 400 and the reason i've said 400 is it will take three swings of the axe to, to kill the player it could be two swings and then the player could go and run off and get some more health by just like gradual healing over time which is already built in um and then they might be able to go back and have another go and then yeah i think 400 is good um so that's how much health we're going to take off we're going to knock the player back knock back the player uh that actually leads on to another question how much force and i think we'll just trial and error that how much force do we knock the player back uh, and then this take health off is oof, is that number there 400 uh so we've just uh we started with our little flow chart axe collides with player and then we damage the player we then talked about uh most should could and won't uh must should could and won't uh which is essentially uh a an acronym for figuring out what the priority is uh, and a good way if you're like mm, i want to make a game uh i've got about fifty thousand ideas 
you can break things down using that like what is the bare essential what's the must which is like the minimum that you need for this thing to actually work and then we had loads of questions or loads of ideas around how this could work and then we just prioritized we need to impact of the axe knocks the player back and takes off 400 health um, based on the fact that the player has a thousand health total uh, we need to play a sound we need to probably do some axe movement and then maybe some effects if we get time cool well that's uh that's um yeah that's our our basic idea for how we're going to do this so now let's go and do it so i think the first part is when the axe collides with the player knock the knock the player back um, if we don't knock the player back when the axe collides with them, there is also another reason that uh, we must do that and not just for fun, effecty stuff, but also because if we don't knock the player back, where is this? If we don't knock the player back, then uh, they might just continuously be getting hit by the axe. So if we knock them back a bit, it means that uh, we won't run into that problem. Okay, we have obstacle script. Well, we did this exercise and we know we're going to need this value somewhere so let's add that as a property let's add a damage amount and i know that this syntax isn't right but that's okay well, for now we're just getting these things in uh damage amount we also need a knock back amount and we also need probably a impact sound probably an impact effect um anything else that we might need a movement that will probably be a separate script which handles the movement um just because at the moment this obstacle script could go on any obstacle like we could make these braziers obstacles by just attaching this obstacle script as soon as i start hard coding movement into this obstacle script i can only use it for the thing that i want to move in this particular way so um we will leave it as just like the interfacing with the health, the player health. Uh, right, let's turn these into some properties. Name equals damage amount, comma, type is a number. Excuse me, that's better. Number, uh, default, let's just set the default to the amount we want, 400, comma. And I'll just copy this and this. I mean this. Let's change these numbers. That is going to be a number. That is going to be a sound asset. This is going to be an effect asset. And these don't have defaults because that doesn't make any sense knockback amount we don't know what the default is so let's just get rid of it and we'll start at zero okay so this plan is already taking shape we've taken the things that we needed which is the fact that we need this number the fact we need that that and the fact we need this knockback force over here and we've turned them all into properties in our code the next thing we can do is we can program this knockback, which I was going to do next. So function obstacle script knock back player. And I'm assuming that's going to pass us a player. So this function will probably get called when the player collides with the axe. And so what we need to do to knock back the player is do some fancy maths. And I'll explain it, but don't necessarily get hung up on this too much. Um, because this isn't really what this stream is about. There's like you, I, I could do a whole stream on this, but essentially, actually, I'm not, I'm not going to explain it too much because I don't want us to get hung up on it. But essentially, we can get the direction from the player to the axe and then shoot the player or f launch the player in, that op in the opposite direction. So I'm the player. I can get... The, me relative to the axe as a vector and then if I do the uh, negative of that vector 
it's the exact opposite direction and I can fire the player in that way. Um, so just bear with me <laughs> with that. Uh, so not back equals player get position minus self get entity get position and then not back equals not back normalize uh, which makes that vector a number between zero and one and then not back equals not back times self dot properties dot not back amount uh, times minus that because we're shooting them in the other direction and then player launch launch them that not back variable uh, let's do 10,000 <laughs> just see what happens okay um, let's also while we're here the other must hey where did it all go there the other must was the other number one was damage the player by 400 and this is what the stream is actually about player how do we damage the player we kind of had a look at that earlier the player is a type of an entity and we can do apply damage and there's actually four different ways we can call this function each of them takes the amount of damage first and then you can choose you can either send a hit result or uh, a direction from which you uh, the player took damage and then if we're going to do direction which is something we've already worked out so we'll do that then we can pass which entity did it and then any damage modifiers um, what I'm concerned about is just do this one here because we've got damage amount we've got the shoot direction because we're using it for the knockback and we've got which entity which entity was it it was the axe so we've got those three values so we're going to pick this one because it's offering us the least amount of resistance to just do that um, so we're going to call this apply damage function and remember if we call the apply damage function it means it will call on damage on any script that's attached to the thing that we're damaging so player apply damage damage amount well that's self dot properties dot damage amount um, vector shoot direction hmm well that's knockback before we did all this stuff so let's just do that afterwards knock back from entity self get entity there so our apply damage took three arguments and we call apply damage on the entity we want to damage so in this case we are going to damage our player entity we're going to apply some damage we're going to supply a number that number was 400 we're going to supply a vector which is the direction from the player uh, from the obstacle to the player or the player to the obstacle we'll have to have a look at what happens in a minute with that and we have to supply what entity did it I'm trying to copy the text now it is a bit blurry that's okay um, hopefully it will unblurry at some point uh, if it doesn't this will all be available um, in the remix of the game which you can go and explore I'm also wondering whether we've got this same code in this script here no that just kills the player Look, that's another thing you can do just literally just kill them with by saying kill um, are we using apply damage anywhere else oh look no no we're not we're literally just using it here uh, okay hopefully that is useful you will be yeah you will have access to this script it'll be part of this um, remixable game if you want to remix the game you go to create remix a game and you look in here for scripting for beginners and it's that one there so I'll be publishing this sh immediately after this um, stream and you'll be able to go in there and 
even if you just copy and paste the code or can copy the code from there um, if your um, if it doesn't sharpen up in in the next couple of minutes so hopefully that works uh let's go and try it out should we should we go and see whether that works i mean good to check that it works before everyone's copying it <laughs> uh okay what happens if i oh yeah i didn't hook up the function did i at the moment it's knockback player oh i was gonna do something separate for damage oh well let's just keep it make it work make it right make it fast Let's just make it work first, and then we'll when we'll sort out making it a beautiful piece of code. Uh, right, that function, uh, that function, what we wrote, <laughs> that function doesn't get called ever. So we need to actually call that. Now we could do on collide, but what if my obstacle doesn't ever collide with the player? What if it's fire? That doesn't collide. Uh, so I'm gonna not force it to be on interact. On, it, on collision. Instead, I'm going to hook up the collision event to it. And then run knockback player. There we go. Hooked up the on collision event to knockback player. Ouch. <laughs> um, that's another good thing about the obstacle course is the respawn. Now, did it actually shoot me in a direction? Oh, it's shooting me forward. It's like a magnet. It's like a magnet with this this minus here. Also, I haven't got any knockback. Oh, I did put a knockback of 10,000. Okay, so I'm expecting to hit the axe and then go absolutely flying. Let's find out whether that's what happens. Ouch. It's taking away a lot of health, but that's okay. I think what's happening is it's not having time to knock back before it it calls this function again, which is fine. Uh, well, we're not reversing the direction, so we don't have to do that afterwards now. So we can launch the player here and then apply damage here. Like that. Let's try that out. Just press F4. Why not? What did that do? Oh, wow. Just goes to the next place that that thing is. So if I put launch and F4. No. Does it go to just where you were last time? Anyway, F5. <laughs> F5 to test. That's where we're at. And ow. Okay, let's try doubling the... Actually, let's try times thing by 10. The amount we get smashed backwards. It could also be that it's shooting me into the ground and the friction is stopping me from... Whoa! <laughs> Ouch. Um, I think that... Uh, yeah, it's like hitting me twice. So let's just half that. Um, 10,000. Yeah. One of the things I'm going to do as well before I launch the player, is I'm gonna make the Z part, which is the up and down of our knockback vector, I'm gonna make that positive. Now I'm gonna make that zero. And I should do that before I normalize it. And I'm doing that because at the moment, if I hit it with my head and it's higher and it's lower than me, it will try and shoot me down into the ground Yeah, that's better. That's better. Okay. Can you make the text bigger? Yeah. I also can make that a bit skinnier. And we're not even using that side today. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, cool. So at the moment, what we're doing is it knocks back the player it knocks back the player using this launch function and it applies some damage to the player. Now, that's cool, but what would be even better would to have this knockback thing, something we can do. 
in future obstacles if we want to, but we don't have to. So we could do something like uh, damage player and then take a player and wait a second. Let's go and have a look at the entry point to this on collision. Because I maybe it takes nope, just takes the just takes that. Okay. Uh yeah. We were gonna make it so that maybe it damages the player, maybe it doesn't damage the player. I don't know. Let's let's leave that for a sec. So we've got an axe, but what'd be really fun is to go back to this diagram and go, okay, what are our number twos now? Movement of axe and sound. Okay, so let's add some movement. Um, entity add script. Let's go with um, a simple rotate and move script. Now, the axis point of origin, which is what it rotates around, is actually handily in, a, in this spot up here. So if I rotate it using the rotate tool, you can see it's already going to be rotating at the right point if we rotate it using code. So rather than me coding a rotate, you know, a thing that makes it rotate, you could just go rotate, put rotate into here in the community and download and install one of the rotate and move scripts. Or, you know, there's one by Echo Rock there. There's one, um, there's, one there's an official one which comes in this package, uh, this blueprint. There's also one by, there's also animations by um, Mighty Co, Mighty Animations package, which is really good. Um, what we'll do is we'll just make this axe swing. Um, so we would expect the swing to start here and then end and then swing and then swing and swing. So let's start here and notice the rotation of the axe. Watch the numbers. Watch the numbers. Minus 90. Yeah, it's the x-axis. It's rotating about the x-axis. X is red. Green is Y. Blue is Z. X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z. And so to figure out what ax, what number it need, you need to change in, the, in here, we have to think, okay, crater... The game world in Crater is a three-dimensional world, which means it has axes that are in three dimensions. If you think about the game world as a huge number line, from left to right would go zero to a hundred, and that's points in the game world, centimeters technically. Zero to a hundred, and that would be on the x-axis. Actually, the x-axis is here, so. 0 to 100 this way on the x-axis. 0 to 100 this way is on this y-axis. 0 being the left point and y and 100 being towards the right. And the same with the number line for the z-axis. 0 is the bottom and 100 going up. So we have our axes and they count in centimeters. And they are always the same directions in every game world. And so if we're going to rotate the axe, we want it to rotate on, let's pick an axis. If we wanted it to rotate on the x axis, then that would rotate it this way. If we wanted it to rotate on the y axis, that would rotate it this way. And if we wanted it to rotate on the z axis, that would spin it around like this. So there's three different ways we can rotate it, and we can rotate it in combinations of all of them. You know? So, if you want to, if you want to make a crazy axe. Um, we're only going to do one, and it's going to be just rotating from this point to this point, which is 180 degrees. It's half a circle. So, and it's half a circle on the x-axis. So if the x-axis to start with, which is, here is a minus 90, then rotation end, if we put 180 here, 
we're expecting it to rotate 100 positive 180 degrees. Let's simulate that. Interesting. <laughs> hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> this is not, this is relative, isn't it? Okay, so it's relative, which means if I press relative, that's the axis. It's rotate, the axes rotate when the ax rotates. So actually, what was the x-axis, because we've rotated our ax to this position, if we click relative and have our move tool, it tells us what the axes are now. So the x-axis now points down. The y-axis now points in the direction we want and the z-axis points across this way. So if we rotate in the y-axis by 180, let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, <laughs> pass. <clears throat> Trial and error. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what if we just did 90 this bit? Is that not, that's not going to work, is it? Yeah, weird. Oh, it's, yeah, okay. So maybe it's the gimbal lock thing. Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> don't stress about that too much. Essentially, uh, because rotation in a 3D world goes round 360 degrees and it actually starts from minus 180 and goes to positive 180. You can end up with some weird things when it's that point where it crosses between a full circle and uh, and zero. Uh, and I think I just, I've just hit one of those points. So what we could do is like start it with minus 179 or minus, sorry, minus 89, which is one less than 90 and move it to uh, 188 and it will work because now it's not trying to go over the other way and what would be even better uh, you know and, and the way I've solved that is I've just doing one less than minus 90 and going to two less than uh, <laughs> two less than 180 which is actually 178 so that should not do anything weird now. There we go. We've got the axe movement going. Uh, now we just need to polish that up. Right? So to polish that movement up, let's unsimulate that. Let's bounce it so that it swings one way and then the other. Let's make the mode ease in and out which means it will slowly increase acceleration, be its fastest point, it right in the middle of the two, and then slowly decrease, as if it's under the control of gravity. Because even though there's gravity in this game, because we're scripting the movement, the gravity is ignored. Um, and because we don't have uh, physics enabled, checked on the axe. Um, that and that and... Let's let's uh, increase the time as well. Uh, decrease the time so it's faster. Hey, we could go faster. It's one second there, one second back. So we'll just tweak it a bit. And it looks a bit cartoony that fast. The slower something moves, the bigger it feels. Right? This is that feels good. Okay, um, what are we missing? What else did we say we were going to do? Uh, sound, when we get hit. Let's look for a sound. Hmm. 
I was going to go for that one. Um, sounds doing weird things. Okay, right. That's the sound. The sound of VO male pain. Uh, just because my character's male. Um, impact effect. We're not doing that just yet. Okay, let's try it out. Wait, I didn't play the sound. So we've got it moving. Let's also play the sound here. Self, get entity. We've done this before. Play sound. Self.properties.impact sound. Cool. So we're knocking the player back. We are using launch. We're applying some damage to the player and we're playing some sound. Yeah, that sounded purposefully painful. Great, it works. We've got a swinging axe, dangerous swinging axe situation. Um, what would be really fun is maybe uh, we don't actually start playing this. We don't actually rotate and move until uh, yeah. It'd be cool to make it only start when we walked in that trigger, but I don't think we've got time. Anyway, we've applied some damage. So when this obstacle does this apply damage it is sending that to the player behind the scenes in Kratos API. It sends the applied damage to the player. The player takes some damage because they can. And it then calls and it calls any on damage events on any script that's attached to the player. So it then reduces the amount of health. And if it kills, if it kills the player, it will even say what they were killed by um, because uh, the health script is already hooked up to the notification script. So let's go and get killed by the axe and it should tell us. <laughs> Something oddly terrifying about, well, it's not oddly terrifying at all. You were killed. There. So, there you go. We're getting killed. Uh, let's do some more things. What if we want to damage something else? So, let's make it so that we can damage something else in our game. Um, this obstacle feels very much like the kind of obstacle that you just want to try and scoot past. You have to either run around it, run around here, or um, time it right through the middle. But let's say, a oh, bug, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know whereabouts you are, maybe behind a little bit, but um, yes, there were, I've, I've experienced, not. it wasn't a bug, it was just, uh, it's a known thing. It's a known thing in many, uh, game engines and platforms that the rotation thing can be uh, it's called gimbal lock in case you wanted to google it um, there's workarounds out there um, what I wanted to do was make it so that we can uh, damage something else in our game maybe uh, maybe we can smash open something or uh, yeah let's make it so that we can smash open let's start with a test dummy or something like that target dummy 
oh, we could make it so we smash this. And then the ceiling comes down. <laughs> the door shuts. And, the, oh, we interact with the gong. Um, we smash the gong. Let's smash the gong. Yeah. And then it makes the gong sound rather than us uh, interacting with it. Let's let's hit it with something. That's a great idea. Okay. Time to do that quite quickly. Uh, half an hour. Let's go. Um, uh, <laughs> what? What weapon would we have in a jungle? Probably a machete. Um, do we have the inventory package in this game already hooked up? Probably not. Okay, let's start with the machete in our hand then. Feels like that's something that our jungle explorer would have. Um, so let's make that a template. Uh, create template um, machete. We will code the machete from scratch. Edit template. Uh, let's add our weapon script. We'll write our own weapon script. And in here, let's say that our player can hold this. Um, so our player needs to hold it. So let's, it's in our game, right? We left it there. Yeah, okay. So this is the only weapon in our game. So we can go self get entity, attach to and then the player that in has logged in. Um, pick up. So pick up this. I'm like, just, I wanna get it so that we can hit, uh, hit something. So I'm just gonna make a weapon quickly. Uh, attach to when a player interacts with this we'll run this pickup function we'll then attach it to the player in their hand underscore r let's see if that works on interact pick up Let's also turn off collision. Ah, oh, wait, we need to collide with all but player. Okay, maybe this is one of them situations where rather than writing our own weapon script, <laughs> we'll use some of the stuff that's already in built just because I'm running out of time and I wanted to finish this off in a nice way. Uh, so let's go and get the inventory package. Install that. Let's get the axe package and install that. Let's then add the inventory to the player. So the user needs the, so when we got our inventory package installed, that came down with all these assets. We've got user inventory, which is a template. We've got player inventory view, which is also a template. And we've got pickup spawner script, which is needed on anything that you need to be able to pick up. The ax has got an ax and a melee script. So, the melee script's important, and so we'll use our axe. Let's go to this inventory. Let's, you know, like I said at, uh, about halfway through, um, anything with user or player need to go on the user or player uh, template. So on the user template entity, create child script folder, and we need to use the user inventory, add that there. And it will come with this defaults thing, and we can actually by default give the the user an axe. That, that is how we're gonna do it, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, player needs the inventory view, add uh, create child script folder, player inventory view, which will just plop open this inventory down here. So now if I test it, I should be being spawned with an axe in my hand.
Right. And then rather than having an axe, let's change it to a machete. So we'll rename it to machete and change the mesh to a machete. Change it for the icon, change it for the mesh. And that's all fine. Let's change the name to machete and go back into the game. We now have a machete. And so when I hit this, I need to make it so that it makes a gong sound. And we can even make it so that it makes a gong sound. It damages the thing. And then it also turns the time of day. Whoa. Uh, magic Sun script is attached to that at the moment. So when we have our axe, let's have a look at our, our axe. It's not an axe. It's a machete. But let's have a look at this melee script. And let's go down to attack. And we have attack and melee impact and here when we when we swing our axe we run this attack function it plays an attack sound if we have one it then plays an animation of our player it does this play action which is essentially an animation on our player uh called melee which means that if he's holding if the player is holding something in their hand um, that is set to a grip type of knife then we can call melee and the player will swing it like a, an axe or a sword we're also passing in these parameters here melee impact is uh, the point at which the melee weapon hits something anything at that point we then fire this calculate damage function so play this animation the character animation send it when we play that animation if we hit something do this calculate damage and in calculate damage this all this code but essentially what's really important here is it then does self do damage if it's hit something so here it's figuring out whether it's hit something and if it has it does do damage works out the distance to the thing works out if it's a character or not if it's not um it works out if they're on the same team or whatever. And at some point, it goes apply damage. So it's exactly the same as the swinging axe that hits the player. It's using the same call, apply damage. Except now it will do it on whatever we've hit, whether that's a player, another player, or uh, an object in our game. So it will fire the on damage function from an object. And so let's tie in on that. Let's tie in a script here. It's the add script, new script. And this will be called my damageable damage of uh, entity script. And we'll have two properties. We'll have one property damage event. And on damage, damage, and then self get entity send nope self dot properties dot damage event colon send uh so it, when this thing is damaged, it will send this event and we can then hook it up to the magic sun. All right, cool. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, Mariam, uh, if you ask on the Discord, they might be able to help in the Ask Anything channel um, just because, uh, and, and I can take a look at it um, probably tomorrow at this point 
Um, the other thing is I will be publishing this remixable game and you'll be able to go into this game, go to these exact scripts and either copy the code or read through it and then um, and put it into your code. So I'm hoping that that kind of support will will help you um, with what what the with the problem you're you're facing. So yeah, I've hit the thing. Did it change the time of day? I feel like it's changed the time of day. Let's see if it's actually doing that. So this script is on, oh, is it on the gong? Also need to have this script on the sundial because the sundial might be getting hit instead of the gong. Uh, damage entity, damage event, fire the event to the gong to the magic sun script. Change time of day. Yay! Wait, did I press interact? I think I pressed interact. Maybe when we damage it, we destroy it. Apply damage. Hit entity, apply damage. Okay, <laughs> I feel like we're getting to the point now where I'm just, I'm thinking this isn't going to be as easy as I thought, and I'm not sure why. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> this thing should be getting damaged. Um, thanks for us. Yeah. Uh, Discord.gg forward slash crater. Uh, right. Yeah. So, yeah. So the apply damage um, should be dealing damage to entities in your any entity. Uh, it should call the on damage on any uh, on an entity when it, an entity is damaged. Oh, I know what I'm missing. <laughs> okay, if you're going to damage entities, make sure you've got damage enabled checked. <laughs> and then you don't need to do this script. You just hook up to the damage on damage function event. Ah, oh, there we go. I knew there was something missing. Okay. So you don't need to do that, you need to do that. So make sure damage enabled is checked on any entity. Make sure you've got damage, ent uh, damage enabled checked on an entity if you're gonna make it damageable, okay? Because otherwise it's not gonna fire the on damage event. Uh, silly Andy, there you go. Uh, we don't need this damage entity uh, script anymore. That was superfluous. Um, yeah, I probably got it written on my notes there. I just wasn't reading them. Let's remove that script. Delete that. Okay. Uh, let's run up to... Let's, let's run up to that. And that is a prime example of banging your head against the wall. Ah, hey, at least it's having a problem with my code now and it's actually getting called make it work then make it right right everyone make it work make it right make it fast so now we can make it right um so when we fire on damage we're calling this change time of day function there's a short clip yeah yeah, thanks, Injun. Yeah, there's a tutorial on how to make smashable loot crates. There's a tutorial on how to set up the inventory and the axe. There's a tutorials for all of this stuff. 
Um, we're nearly at the end of this one. I am literally just going through uh, this magic sun script. Change time of day is expecting the player. Otherwise, it's going to you know, have a problem at this point. Um, when we have on, on damage called, we're, it will pass a, an amount of damage. It will call, put also pass the thing that's caused the damage. Now, that could be another entity like our swinging axe, or it could be a player. And that's where we can hook into this, um, this thing. So change time of day is a function we want to call eventually. But let's hit it with create another function that accepts these three arguments. Uh, on damage and this will get called automatically so then we don't even need to hook up this this is an even better way uh, we will just pass these three arguments and when this thing's damaged let's do the on damage so when the sun dial gets hit we'll pass that event up to the gong when the gong gets hit, and remember that we're doing that because this sundial is actually taking up the middle part of the gong. If the gong gets hit, then we don't actually need to hook up the on damage event here because the on damage in the actual uh, magic sun script will get called anyway. And all we need to do, rather than destroying this object, we just need to call change time of day with the damage causer because that was the player. So self, change time of day, and damage causer. And so uh, this has been not a great second half <laughs> to, this, to this tutorial stream. Um, riddled with bugs, forgetting about the damage enabled check, check mark. But now I hit the gong and there we go. It works. <laughs> Eventually. Hooray. So... That is how to, uh, we're going to probably wrap it up there. That's how to get killed by a flying axe. That's also how to damage a priceless sundial and gong. And that's also <laughs> how to uh, debug code and bang your head against the wall on stream. Um, and yeah, it's a prime example of exactly what I was talking about at the start of this stream where sometimes you're going to hit bugs and well, not sometimes you are definitely going to hit bugs as a programmer. That's that's just a part of life. Um, and sometimes they're bugs that you didn't know about. So how could they be your fault? Right? You, you try something out and it's causing problems and you can't figure out why. Uh, and it's because you're not not sure about um, the right way to call a script or something like that. You also will come up against bugs where you're your own worst enemy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know you know how to do this. You've done this many, many times and you still make the odd mistake here or there. So just bear that in mind. Sometimes it's going to be like that. And that's okay. Just, you know, approach it as a journey. Um, you know, learning to program, there's no end point when you have learnt everything there is to know about programming. Because as we saw last week with all the new features that came out, there's always going to be new things to learn. So there's a whole bunch of stuff came out in this uh, battle pass, along with all of these wonderful cosmetic items. You'll now see that on the uh, API docs, there's NPCs. So we can add NPCs into our game, uh, which I'll be looking at in, um, well, I looked at in a tutorial, which is available on YouTube. Um, Got so we've got NPCs. There's also uh, scaling now. So if you have a look at a mesh, for example, you can scale a mesh. Uh, and so there's all these new features. So where you might have thought, hey, I know everything there is to know about Creator, and I can make whatever I want. Suddenly, new feature alert, and now you're learning along with everyone, albeit you have a an understanding already of of how things are put together in Creator. So. It's just worth bearing in mind that signing up to be a coder or a programmer is basically signing up to be a lifelong learner. You are going to spend the rest of your life learning new systems, new ways of doing things and 
believe it or not, that is an absolute joy. Uh, and it's one of the, well, it's my main reason for being a, uh, a coder or a programmer is it, it's never, it's never static. It's always moving. You're always gaining new skills, always developing things. Um, and one last thing before uh, I leave, I really wanted to highlight um, a fantastic resource, uh, which is Game Programming Patterns, um, which is a book. And uh, I have to plug this because I use it all the time. Um, and there's a version online. And essentially, if you don't know much about patterns, uh, there was an architect in the 60s, 70s who said, hey, everything's a pattern and talked about architecture's patterns. Uh, and everything's exploded with patterns and ideas around that. There's a book called Game Design Patterns, which builds on that same thing. Uh, and programming patterns is this idea of using like patterns, familiar patterns to accomplish um, programming architectural programming issues in games uh, and it's originally well a lot of this stuff is based on the called the gang of four uh wrote a book in the 90s when c plus plus first came out about all this like object oriented programming how to use it in a really really good way and make sure that your architecture was all tidy so that you can make huge games without having messy code uh, and then this game programming patterns um, resource takes all of that and distills it into uh, fairly straightforward ways to think about things. Some of the best uh, parts of this, uh, I would definitely check out the object pool if you're doing any kind of firing projectiles or handling lots of things that are being destroyed and then spawned. Um, definitely take a look at that. And whilst the code examples are in C++, uh, if you read the comments in between the code, you should be able to understand a little bit about what's going on. It usually starts with a why why this is an important thing. Like it starts with a problem and then says, this is how we're going to solve the problem. And then it takes you through how to use the pattern to do that. So it's an incredible resource. And I just wanted to throw that out there for everyone. I use it all the time. Um, uh, yeah, other resources are widely available, but that's a really, really good one for uh, developing as you continue your journey, now that you've got the basic concepts of uh, lo the logical flow of a program from line by line, where things enter scripts in functions, um, you know, we have like these entry points and how you call those events from entities in the game world and how some of them uh, like in our health script, some of those events are called by crater and some of those events are called by us when we hook up to those things. And yet some more events uh, are called by the code itself. Um, so that's essentially it. You've got these blocks, these functions. That's one of the concepts. You've, we've talked about properties as well. We've talked about conditionals and how we can use conditions to direct our logical flow. So it's not just going from top to bottom, it's now splitting depending on whether something is true or false. We've talked about schedules and how we can split the timing of things. So we can ask some code to wait while some event in our game is going on and then carry on executing whilst the rest of our game code keeps going. We've also talked about for loops and arrays and how to use groups of objects uh, indexed with numbers and then loop through those things to affect large sort of communities of objects in our game. We talked about the server and the client and how those two things mesh together, how you can run code on just the server, code on just the client, or a combination thereof to create exciting and dynamic things like roles and forcing your players to work together in specific ways or against each other in other ways. Um, uh, and also display widgets and things like that. We've also finally looked at leveraging some of the inbuilt Crater API functionality for some of the more game-based systems like health and damaging things, damaging items in the game, damaging the player, damaging each other, uh, and even very, very quickly using the inventory package, which I wasn't intending to do today, um, but, I've very quickly uh, thrown together by just installing the inventory package, putting it on the player and the user, installing the axe package and changing it to a machete. You've seen how quickly I can get a melee weapon up and running there. Um, and so we've looked at 
packages as well, which is a really valuable and important thing to speed up your development and get to the crucial part of today's stream, which was make the game. Don't necessarily make a bunch of game systems, focus on making the game. And you might find that you can make a game that's very, very simple in terms of technical um, coding, but is actually has a lot of impact in terms of emotions and understanding and storytelling. Um, so, uh, Mariam, uh, Mariam, I, I, Mariam, sorry. I hope that you're getting some assistance on Discord. I'll have a quick check over there now. Thank you so much for everyone, uh, to everyone who joined today. I know that it probably took a little bit of patience to stick with it, but um, I appreciate you joining and watching. And um, this was the end. This is the end of the Scripting for Beginners mini series. Uh, and it's the end of that series because I think that once you've got the concepts of conditionals, for loops, clients, uh, clients and servers, um, some of the game based systems, packages and all the stuff that we've talked about in the last five uh, weeks, once you've got that down, you're no longer a beginner. <laughs> so that is that is the end of scripting for beginners. Um, if you need uh, next week, there won't be a stream because it's a bank holiday in the UK and other parts of the world as well. Uh, and the week after that, I'll be back on Monday, uh, four till six p.m. Uh, with uh, an exciting new stream series that we're going to be starting. Uh, if you want more streaming delights this week, then make sure to subscribe to this channel on Twitch and YouTube and check out Russ tomorrow. He's going to be doing some game dev uh, and he'll be doing that tomorrow, I think, eight o'clock. Uh, AJ will be playing some games on Wednesday, uh, which is really cool. Um, there's a tutorial coming out this week on Thursday, which is going to be on the new audio API, the changes to the audio API and how to leverage those to add some depth and variety to the sound in your game. Uh, so that's really, really exciting as well. And then, like I said earlier, join us for Feedback Friday. If you're working on something and it's half finished, but you want some ideas about how which direction to go in, you want to test out some of your multiplayer uh, you want to just, you know, play with lots and lots of people, then that's a good opportunity. It's also a great opportunity to play some games and think critically about game design. So playing other people's games and offering them feedback is just as great for your own learning as it is pu putting your own game out there and taking on board other people's feedback. So contributing and uh, taking um, from that Feedback Friday is a worthwhile endeavor if you are serious about um, making awesome games that win awards. Cool. Uh, right. Well, I'm I'm going to call it there. If you've got any questions, don't hesitate to uh, add them below in the comments, like and subscribe and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and if you get stuck, ask anything on the Discord channel, uh, uh, discord.gg forward slash creator. And I will see you very shortly uh, as, yeah, I'll probably see you on, on Thursday by the power of YouTube tutorials. Take care, everyone. Have a lovely evening.